going to talk about international atheism, um, from issues of blasphemy laws to the fact that um, the freedom we enjoy to keep our lives, our livelihoods here in the U.S. are not enjoyed around the world. Um, with us today, I'm going to I'm going to announce. The lovely Christina Rad, who is a Romanian blogger, and uh, she is someone who's got a lot to say. Mariam Namazi, who has spoken internationally about the rights of women that are denied under religious oppression. And my home dude, who now lives in Washington, D.C., not with me, but near me. Um, yeah, we are neighbors. Uh, Faisal Al-Mutar, he is here to um, share quite a bit, and uh, I'm going to start with you just because you're nearest to me, physically, actually, and um, technically. Um, again, any one of those questions, make sure you write them down, pass them up to me. I want to just let you start telling your story, and then uh, we will go from there. Sure. Uh, salam alaikum, everyone. Alaikum assalam. I, I'm, I was I'm confused. I'm actually came here to convert people to Islam. <laughs> Not to talk international atheism. Sorry. Well, uh, I'm Faisal Mutar. Uh, I'm the founder of the Global Secret Humanist Movement. Um, I was born and raised in Iraq. Uh, I arrived in the United States last year. Actually, my first convention was the American Atheist Convention in Austin. Uh, and I feel like I found a family over here. Uh, my work is, is pretty much centered uh, around creating a grassroots uh, secular movement as well as uh, I'm, I'm very much focused on humanism because I think that humanism can bring all people together to create a positive change in the world. I think that humanists all over the world need to be organized, more organized and be a powerful lobby uh, to create a positive change. The reason why I got into secular activism myself was after the Iraq war, we had the first elections in 2005, and then the Islamists have taken over. And, the re and I've tried to study and analyze the reason why they have been very much successful is because, and I want to give them credit for that, is because they were organized. Uh, we only had a few liberal secular conferences in Baghdad, and the general admission is $500 while the, the Islamists were able to organize in every mosque, in every district. And that's something that I think the humanist and secular movement is missing. Well, I'm not advocating for building mosques for secularists, but I, I think I get my point straight, is that secularists need to organize in every local community, whether in Utah and Salt Lake City, whether it's in Baghdad, whether it's in Tehran, whether it's in Kabul, and it's time, to create, it's time for secularists to unite and create a better world. Thank you. Miriam? Um, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think I, I want to speak on the issue of apostasy. I think punishing apostates is a long standing and fundamental feature of all religions, and of course, Islam is no different. Um, but in, in a sense, it is because of Islamism, which is a far right political movement using Islam as its banner. And it's what I call this error's inquisition or totalitarianism. And to the degree that it has power, that is the degree to which it tries to control pe people's lives, who they have sex with, what music they listen to, what they wear, and even what they are allowed to think. And Islamists will kill, threaten, intimidate anyone who interprets things differently, thinks differently, dissents, and tries basically just to live 21st century lives. One of the characteristics of an inquisition is policing of thought. And the reality is that even for a lot of Muslims, it's not possible to pick and choose and have a personal religion. You want to go to school? They'll try to kill you on your way there. You don't want to wear a veil? Um, acid in your face is, is their response. And of course, if you want to be an atheist, uh, a mortad, that is the most heinous of crimes. Uh, and the response is usually off with your head. Um, I don't know if you heard recently that Saudi Arabia has equated atheism with terrorism. 
Um, I mean, the, the bitter irony of them killing us, and then we're the ones who are called terrorists. Um, and I'm sure you know that apostasy is a prosecutable offense in over 30 countries where Sharia law is, um, has influence, and 11 countries in which apostasy is punishable by death. And of course, there are religious justifications in the Quran, in the Hadith, which are the sayings and actions of Muhammad, Islam's prophet. And from a religious standpoint, obviously it's very clear that allowing apostasy um, is, um, it hurts the preservation of Islam. And this is something that a well-known Islamic scholar, Qaradawi, has said. And of course, I use the term scholar very lightly. As uh, Richard Dawkins says, you do need to have read more than one book to be considered a scholar. <laughs> Aside from religious justifications, I want to say here that I think apostasy laws and the execution of apostates are the ultimate means of political rather than religious control. And it's used to silence anyone who questions their rule. Very often people who might not even be atheists. Right now, Roya Nobacht in Iran, she's a British Iranian, went back to visit her family. She's been accused of apostasy, has been in jail for the past five months only because on Facebook she said that the regime is a little too Islamic. I would have said a lot worse. Um, and you have two Bangladeshi high school students who've recently been attacked by an Islamist mob and then the police rescued them only to put them in prison for apostasy. And basically their crime was to criticize Jamaat Islami, which is an Islamist uh, party in, in Bangladesh. So it's very often used to silence anyone who questions their rule. Uh, so in my opinion, if you want to challenge apostasy laws, first and foremost, the challenge has to be a political one. And that explains why I've helped to organize Council of Ex-Muslims, which is atheist organizations across the world, from the UK, Germany, uh, North America uh, recently established their ex-Muslim group. Uh, to um, uh, Morocco. It's the first public atheist organization in a country where Islam is the state religion. <laughs> now, now, don't forget that Christianity also executed its apostates. And if we look at Christianity today, it's not that the tenets, its dogma, or its principles have become lovelier and cuddlier since the days of the Inquisition, but rather its social and political influence, its relationship to the state has changed. And obviously, a religion that's been reined in by an enlightenment is very, very different from one which is spearheading an inquisition. Mm -hmm. And challenging this means, of course, having the courage to think for oneself, as the philosopher A.C. Grayling said about the Council of Ex-Muslims. It is also about breaking taboos that come with renouncing Islam and paving the way for others to leave Islam and become atheists. Mm -hmm. But it's mainly one of the most important aspects is that it is a fight back against Islamism. Some will say, why don't we just call ourselves atheists and not ex-Muslim? But atheists alone cannot begin to describe the risks and the threats that are linked with leaving Islam. Others will say that the Council of Ex-Muslims is an unnecessary provocation. Yes, it is a provocation. Unnecessary, no. Unnecessary, no. Okay, Miriam. Miriam. Um, okay. Islamists will often tell us, don't provoke, don't offend, don't criticize, and no one will get hurt. If anyone believes them, and there are, trust me, still people who believe them, they don't yet understand this movement. They need no excuses. Murder and mayhem is part and parcel of their movement. Throughout history, barbarity has been pushed back, not by tiptoeing around it, accommodating it, appeasing it, tolerating it, but by facing it head on. They say we are not allowed to leave Islam. We say we are not asking for their permission. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. So I want to thank American Atheists for having me. And I want to thank whoever decided to put the international panel at 9 a.m. Because jet lag people are super fun. That <laughs> 
So I was born and raised in Romania. I still live in Romania, so I guess I can talk a little bit about my country. It is a deeply religious country. About 80% of the entire population is Christian Orthodox. Then we have some Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, but the people who have no declared religion or are atheists are 0.2% of the entire population. Creationism is taught in schools. Actually, evolution was taken out of the biology classes. It was reintroduced a few years later because of the pressure. However, we are still teaching creationism in school, and as a result, about 75% of the people believe that God created the world and believe in creationism. Um, now, one, one good thing was that last year in May, we had the first secular humanist conference in the Eastern Europe ever, and that was held in Romania, which was really, really good and exciting. I, I'm sorry I couldn't be there, I was out of the country, but I saw some images, I saw there were about five people in the audience, so I call that a success. <laughs> the theme of the conference was education, science, and human rights, and I saw the press covering it, called it the gay conference, because that is one of the most offensive things you can call somebody. So I guess um, I'm going to shut up now because I'm not very good at this. I, I am expecting some questions, so let's do that. Okay. Uh, I would like to make a comment on what Mariam Nawaz is saying about Islam, and that's something I've been facing all over when I talk about the religion of peace. Uh, is Islam has always been immune and sheltered itself from criticism. And unfortunately, there are people, mostly the hardcore left-wing Americans, and even in Europe, have, and under the concept of minority rights, they have given Islam a free pass to do whatever they want in the name of that's their culture and we should respect it. And my answer to that, humans have rights, but cultures and beliefs don't. And cultures... <laughs> cultures and beliefs should be open to discussion, to criticism, to debate. And Islam has been for centuries able to protect itself and shelter itself from any kind of questioning. And and the logic behind this apostasy nonsense that they want to kill people for leaving Islam is because, as, in as far as my understanding goes, is that because they think if you leave Islam, you are betraying the state. Because Islam was made by some, by some scholars, quote unquote, think that Islam was intentionally made to create a theocracy because Muhammad, Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, <laughs> has created uh, a state. So the Quran itself was written during Muhammad was written, it was alive, sorry. And he was able to build a state upon the values of the Quran. And so they think that anybody who leaves religion is an enemy of the state. Uh, the same thing, the logic used by Ayatollahs, when somebody criticized, criticizing them, they say it's a, it's a crime against God. Uh, because they think that they are appointed by God because the word Ayatollah comes from the hidden Imam who supposedly appointed them to do the job for him. Uh, and so that, that is very good to understand that when we try to criticize Islam, also that's something very important, we're not to criticize all Muslims. There are, all, there are many Muslims who are peaceful, peace-loving, very understanding, nice people. I was raised by moderate Muslims. I know a lot of moderate Muslims. But it also needs to be mentioned that Islam has not been reformed yet. And that's what makes it different from uh, other world religions, the Abrahamic religions like Christianity and Judaism. And uh, in my opinion, I think Islam of the 21st century is a Christianity of the Dark Ages. And we have to understand that and deal with it in this way. There are 13 countries that execute people for being atheists. All of them are Muslim, dominated. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the same thing can be said for uh, gays. Most of the countries that execute gays are Muslim dominated, except one, which is Uganda, Christian dominated. And, uh, and that's a problem. We need to, when we try to criticize, or try to criticize religion and evaluate the danger, 
we should prioritize, in my opinion, and not to paint a brush, all religions are equally dangerous at the moment. Yes, probably Christianity was dangerous in some, in some centuries, and that's true, they used to kill heretics, but it also needs to be mentioned that I also tried to make this experiment and ask people to make a cartoon about Jesus and a cartoon about Muhammad and see which embassies are going to be burned and who are the people who are going to burn these embassies and what religion do these people follow. And this is not a fringe minority. And it's time to call a spade a spade. Uh, Miriam wanted to jump in there. Oh. I, I mean, uh, I agree somewhat with Faisal. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I am on the left myself, so I find uh, the left's politics of appeasing and defending Islamism a, a politics of betrayal, a betrayal of all of its principles, a betrayal of um, uh, those struggling, the working class and people's social movements struggling and fighting against this monster every day in the Middle East and North Africa and Asia and in the West and in the West. They have turned their backs on us, um, you know, and I think uh, while it's very important to stand up to them and to say, as Faisal said, that you know, culture is culture and religion is their, their ideas or practices that are unfair, they should be open to unconditional criticism and that's not the same as attacking people. On the other hand, I do think there is also a, a far right that to me is exactly like the Islamists. Islamism is our far right. And groups like Stop Islamization of America, the Pamela Gellers and Robert Spencers, you know, the, um, the groups that oppose Sharia and oppose Islamism, but they do it in order to scapegoat and attack Muslims and immigrants. I think that we need to stand up to them as well. Because we are against Islamism and Sharia. We are defending atheism because we want to defend human dignity and the human being not because we want to attack a certain group of people. I stand very firmly in defense of a majority of Muslims. I don't say Muslims are the same as Islamists in the same way that I don't think that the Christian right represents all Christians. They don't, they don't. And in fact, the first victims of Islamism are Muslims or those who are labeled as such. And they are the ones on the front lines in Afghanistan and Iraq and Saudi Arabia who are fighting at great risk and resisting at great risk. And so we have to defend them uh, if we are going to move, be able to move forward and, and stand up to this movement. I just want to add real quickly because it was said, you know, make a cartoon about Jesus and then a cartoon about Muhammad and see what happens and we actually saw what happened. And uh, I make videos on YouTube, I criticize religion pretty often when I talk about Christianity. And when I talk about Islam, I can see the same reaction because if I make a video against Islam and I don't get at least five death threats, I'm thinking I did something wrong. <laughs> yeah, on what Mariam uh, uh, Namazi was saying uh, about the far right Christian, uh, I think that is an unfortunate case. Uh, because the people who, who mostly should defend women rights, the liberals who defend women rights and, and have created a vacuum because they don't talk about Islam and they have created, uh, sh uh, sheltered it and protected it from criticism. We ha the liberals have created a vacuum in which the ha hardcore Christian rights who are uh, just like the, what this name of pastor, Terry Jones, who was a nut job from Florida, and, and wanted what burned the Quran in the anniversary of 9-11. And, and that, that is, I think, is a very big problem because people like these nuts, like Pastor Terry Jones and, and Robert Spencer and others who are deeply, have a lot of anti-immigrant hatred, anti, all, all of type of hatred, and they, they are right for the wrong reasons. Is that they think it's true that Islam is more dangerous, but they are fighting against Sharia, mostly because they think Christianity is better, or they think that, uh, and if you look more to what they say, they always say America is a, Christ a Judeo-Christian nation and try to defend the Judeo-Christian heritage. I did an interview last week with a social conservative person in Iowa, and he, he also mentioned, he said that Thomas Jefferson was a Christian, uh, most of the founding fathers, he said that the constitution of the country is the Bible, and I, I 
I told him, it's, it's, I'm, it's sad that I'm an immigrant, but I know more about America than you do. Uh, and uh, so I, I think it's, it's time for, for liberals and people who support freedom of speech, women rights, LGBT rights, to stand with their fellow liberals in the Middle East and worldwide and not protect Islamists against them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, yeah. no, applaud. That was very good. Um, a number of people are asking a, a question in a similar vein, and it, it deals with when you talk about helping uh, atheists, particularly in countries in which identification as an atheist will get one murdered, um, how do you even start to do that? What can be done to promote secularism in the Ummah? How do we you know, even get into that, particularly for those of us who are not Muslim and are Western and are often considered racist and uh, cultural, you know, yeah, cultural relativists for, for daring to say that girls should be educated, um, girls should not be circumcised. Um, one's conscience is the highest authority and not a book. Uh, should I start? Uh, I, think, I, I think that's a very good question, um, and I always get asked about it. I think it can be done indirectly. That you don't, well, in countries in which atheism is considered a crime, what you can do, at least in Iraq, and I've done a lot of fundraising for that, is to help support groups that go with the values that we support. So there is a, there is a women rights group in Iraq that I raised about $15,000 for, is about lit literacy, spreading literacy among women, because about, according to lay statistics, 47% of Iraqis are illiterate, 75% of them are women. And there are women rights groups that are working, operating in the country as we speak, who are doing great job to spread, to spread the literacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The same goes for LGBT groups who are also hidden. So what we can do, other than go create atheist groups, we can support groups that align with values. Because I can tell you something: gay rights don't gay uh, gay Iraqis don't support Islamists <laughs> because they're going to get killed for supporting those. So if you're going to support gay rights groups. Most of them support secularism, most of them support a freedom of thought, etc., etc. So you can do indirect support into groups that align with our values of humanism and uh, ethical thought. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a couple of uh, questions here. I think the first is about how to help. And I think one is to support organizations like ours that are working with atheists um, across the Middle East and North Africa. The other is that I think as a result of the Arab Spring and as a result of the uprisings and revolutions in the region, and also because of social media, we are now able to see the large numbers of atheists and secularists in that region. It is not, I think it's very clear today that secularism or atheism is not a Western construct because there is an explosion of atheism in the Middle East and North Africa. There is an anti-Islamic backlash in many of these places. No one hates Islamists more than those that have to live under its rule. That is for certain. That is for certain. Um, so, so I think it's a question of really supporting uh, the secularists on the ground. We're having a conference in October in London to do exactly that. We are bringing atheists and secularists from the Middle East and North Africa many of them imprisoned uh, for, for years because of their atheism. Someone like Ben Baz Aziz, who was arrested in Kuwait for his atheism and has now been deported back to Egypt. He's originally Egyptian. Someone like Walid al Husseini, who was in prison in the Palestinian Authority for a year for his atheism. Someone like Amina Sabui, the topless Tunisian activist who is an atheist and who was imprisoned in Tunisia. A lot of these people are coming because we're hoping to make links internationally for, for people to know who these wonderful, uh, wonderful risk takers uh, are and to work, uh, to, to build an international front in defense of secularism and atheism because if you, you know, the, the Islamists work together, we also need to work together. And I just want to make a final point about, you know, the question, uh, the, the issue that 
that was raised on, uh, you know, well, we're Western and, you know, we feel uncomfortable speaking. I mean, this goes back to the whole issue of identity politics, which is bogus and nonsense. I never felt that I couldn't speak about racial apartheid in South Africa because I wasn't black or South African. You know, I, I don't feel I have to be gay in order to defend gay rights. You don't have to be a woman to defend women's rights. In fact, some of the greatest defenders of women's rights are men, and some of the greatest misogynists are women. Identity politics is bogus. It's bogus. And I think we need to go back to the concept of people as human beings. You know, reaction is not stitched in the DNA of someone just because they come from the Middle East, and enlightenment values is not stitched into the DNA of someone because they live in America or Europe. You know, and um, I, I want to hop in and, and bring Christina in here for just a moment. Um, am I causing that feedback? Uh, okay. Sorry. Jesus. <laughs> um, when, when you consider the distinctions in orthodoxy in the U.S. and that which exists in countries like Romania, like in Russia, um, what are the similarities you see? And does that to you bring to mind much of what um, our two ex-Muslims on the panel are talking about? Um, there are a lot of similarities. I think the difference is that um, with Orthodox Christianity, there is a more emphasis on modesty, so you will not see the big churches with the gold and everything. But uh, also, Orthodox Christianity is a little more tolerant towards other religions. Uh, we, and I say we because I used to be one. So we don't believe that uh, if you have another religion you will burn in hell we just say we don't know what's going to happen however you have to have a religion so it's okay if you have a different religion as long as you have one if you're an atheist then yeah you'll burn mm -hmm. <laughs> i want to go back for a moment to the idea about what can be done to help and this is for everyone i'm going to start again with you christina um, President Barack Obama was criticized when he just went to Saudi Arabia and didn't say anything about human rights abuses or whatnot. Um, the world just looked to Sochi and said, yay, go our respective countries and uh, to hell with the human rights abuses there. What, in your opinion, uh, are some of the political ways of addressing this problem, perhaps that American voters, American citizens can help to push our leaders to advance around the world, particularly when it comes to human rights abuses under the guise of religion. Uh, maybe I'm not the best person to talk about American politics. However, I think not necessarily politically, but I think what should be done is exactly what we are doing with these conferences, with supporting foundations that are supporting like the Council of, of Ex-Muslims. So um, from where I'm standing, I think that what we're doing is right because atheism, and not necessarily atheism, but non-religious people are a growing demographic, even in Eastern Europe. Um, I mean, I personally have no faith in any government, and I think that they, um, their, their interests are linked, their, their interests are linked, uh, even those that pretend to be fighting a war on terror, uh, for example, the US, its militarism has helped to increase Islamism and Islamic terrorism against the, the, the people of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, I want an end to the Iranian regime, but I definitely don't want a US invasion or even economic sanctions, because to me, they are two sides of the same coin. And I think, for me, I come to these conferences because my only hope is you people and real international solidarity. The type of dirty work that we did when we ended apartheid in South Africa, when we supported the civil rights movement, when we supported, and I'm not talking about us, some of this happened before my time, but I'm, I'm not that old, but you know, uh, the, the suffragist movement, that sort of dirty, hard work that doesn't have a quick answer, but you know, 
showing real solidarity, giving real support. You know, right now we have, we had a couple of atheists in prison, Alex An in Indonesia, he is free today uh, as a result of our work. You know, uh, you have someone like um, um, uh, Amina Taylor, Amina Sabui. I mean, she, uh, you know, went topless in Tunisia. She uh, scrawled um, graffiti on a mosque wall. She was in prison. She could have been in prison for six or seven years at the very least. She was beaten. She was given virginity tests. She was taken to an imam to try to help sort out her atheism. She is free and living in Paris now as a result of our work. So don't forget that, don't forget it makes a difference. And even the worst of dictators like the Iranian regime, Sakina Mohammad Yashtiani, the Iran, the stoning case, she is free today because of this international solidarity. So it works, it works. And we need to keep building those links and keep working together. Well, uh, I'm, unlike Mariam, uh, we have this difference. I do have uh, little faith in government, uh, especially because I'm a result of a country that was invaded by the United States, uh, namely Iraq. Uh, I think, I do believe that the United States of America has a moral duty to create a positive change in the world. Uh, I find it a bit ironic considering that most of the socialists are against uh, United States uh, interventions. But when socialists talk about rich should help the poor, because, well, the rich have more and more, more responsibility to help the poor because they are rich. Well, America is more powerful and much better than most countries in the world. And, and I think that, I mean, one of the ways that I think came as a result of United States intervention, I do not think the United States intervention was intended to help Iraqis, I don't think, but I do believe in the theory of the invisible hand by, by Adam Smith, that he said that uh, good things happen as a result of consequences that are not really the result of the intention itself. So when the United States went into World War II, their intention was not to end the Holocaust. It came as a result that the Nazis fell down and the Holocaust ended. So Iraqis now have much more freedom of press they have more free speech, they have better economy. Iraqi Kurdistan, the northern Iraq, have better women rights, have better gay rights, they have a secular constitution over there, all as a result of American intervention. Some people disagree with that, but these are facts. Now, I, I do believe that it can be mixed. Not everything has to be done by the government. I think it's, it's better to be done by non for profits the NGOs, and create a solidarity with the people over there. But I think it's wrong to say that America, whether it's militarily or whether it's power, I mean, one of the ways I, I, I may think of, uh, I do agree that sanctions don't work because I lived under sanctions after 1991. Iraq lived under sanctions and most of the Iraqis, the average Joe, his salary was $2 a month while Saddam Hussein was building palaces and mosques. So actually the dictators and the people that you want to face sanctions against don't really get affected. It is the average middle class worker who get affected by the sanctions. But I do believe that the United States can support, whether it's through government or through non-profits, support forces that align with, Amer with values that we stand for. Uh, in, in the Green Revolution in Iran, I remember and all the photos out there of liberal secularists who stand for a lot of our values of women rights, LGBT rights, freedom. The same thing goes for the Syrian revolution when it first started. And they were just asking for some help. Any help, whether it was funding, whether it was money funding, whether it was training in military, etc., etc. And they were refused. And eventually they got killed by Bashar al-Assad on one side and the rebels quote unquote, who are funded by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey. And, and the, now the, the good voices in Syria are mostly gone. So if United States government, whether it was President Obama, even the international community, I mean, we should not only put United States as the only moral, uh, there, I mean, there are countries like Scandinavia, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Finland, also have a lot of freedom, a lot of rights who should stand 
with us and form an international coalition to help those in need in these countries. I think it's questionable and debatable to say that as a result. First of all, let me say I'm not a pacifist. I don't think that force is a bad thing. I believe in a revolutionary action of people, which um, um, is a type of force. Um, you know, so it, it's not that I think that any type of intervention is wrong. I do think, though, that if you look at what's happened um, as a result of U.S. militarism in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and so on and so forth, it hasn't. Um, uh, necessarily improve the situation of, uh, of people and women there. Even in Afghanistan, for example, uh, you know, the, the U.S. is talking about bringing the Taliban back to the negotiating table. And in Iraq, there are now laws that are being debated of making, uh, you know, uh, marriage of a nine-year-old girl permissible and um, not allowing women to travel without a male guardian and so on and so forth, you know. I, I think you know, the, the thing about the intervention is that you have to look at why interventions are taking place and what interests are being, are being addressed. And in a sense, I think that for the U.S. Um, and, and for a majority of, for, for a large number of Western governments, like the British government, uh, they're, they're, it's not really their concern of the human rights violations that are taking place in those countries. For example, European governments have had very close relations with the Iranian regime. The U.S. is a very close ally of uh, Saudi Arabia, which is one of the pillars of Wahhabism and Islamism in the world today. And I think the problem is that they don't mind Islamic terrorism as long as it's terrorizing uh, populations in the Middle East and North Africa. What they're concerned about is terrorism that comes out of Islamism's sphere of influence. And therefore, um, you know, in that sense, I think it's, it, it, it's, it, it does a detriment to the secularists and others who are fighting in, in the region. I think if we're going to, you know, I, I was born and raised in Iran. I will never look to the Iranian regime ever, ever, ever for any help and any support. And in the same way, I think that Americans should, shouldn't look to their government for support for real human issues because they have, I think very often, you know, class interests take precedent to human interests and profit takes precedence to human need. And therefore, I think if we look to them to solve our problems, we are looking in a very, very wrong place. And we need to look to each other. We need to look to each other. Yeah, but, but I, I wanted to make clear that intentions on a pragmatic level don't matter. I don't really care w from a perspective of a person who is Iraqi, and if you look around, if you go to Basra and the places in southern Iraq, in which you go to families and you see that Saddam kills six members of their family in front of, in front of the person, I don't think this person cares whether uh, American intentions are oil or not. They care about being liberated from a fascist dictator who killed 2.5 Iraqi, 2.5 million Iraqi people. Which so, the U.S. used to support for a very long time. I for, but still, and that actually makes the point that because the United States supported this fascist dictator, they have moral duty to kick him out, not to keep him in power. So the argument that because the United States supported Saddam before, it makes a better argument to invade Iraq than to, to leave Saddam in power. Because if he was left in power, we would have Uday Saddam Hussein, who used to send, send the intelligence to a school and pick 10 random girls and then raid them and send, send their dead bodies to their family. That was how brutal Saddam Hussein was. So, Yes, I'm all for non for profit supporting, but there also needs, it, it needs to be a balance. Just like you cannot have absolute free market, you need to have regulations and so forth. So you can have a mix between government work plus non for profits working together to change the world. And non for profits can play a very major role in lobbying into changing and secularizing U.S. foreign policy to the way that goes with the U.S. national interest plus uh, the, 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 the interest of the people in this, in this region. There are conferences that debate this very issue. <laughs> and I, I lament the fact that we, we're going to put a pin in that one right now. We have about five minutes 
until the conclusion of this panel. So um, we're around for, for the remainder of the day. I'm, I'm sure people will continue well, to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> with, with love though, right? Um, I would like everyone to offer a closing statement at this point. I've got a lot of questions that there's no way we're going to get to. Uh, I'm sorry, but that is the nature of panels that are 45 minutes long. So um, Christina, would you begin? Uh, if, if there's anything that came up or anything that you want to make sure that this, that this listening audience and those who are streaming at atheist.org slash live uh, get to hear. Yeah, there, were, there was a lot of talk about American politics. I didn't want to get in the middle of that because I was scared. But just <laughs> to give you a quick idea about what's happening in Romania, our president was wearing purple so the witches' uh, hacks don't affect him because the witches were putting cur curses on him so he was wearing purple. Um, also, there was a case uh, where a young man who was suffering from hepatic cirrhosis, I think it's called in English, wrote a letter to the president asking to be euthanized because all his organs were failing, he was in absolute pain, morphine wasn't working anymore, he just wanted to die. I understand that the president could not grant him that right, we're part of the European Union, he cannot do whatever he wants. However, his answer was that life is a gift from God and we have to live it with all the good things and all the bad things. And this is the president of a nation saying that in public, just to give you an idea about what's happening in other places in the world. Oh, yes. Um, well, I mean, I guess as a closing, I would like to appeal to all of you here uh, to see the fight for um, atheism and secularism and for a society where religion and Islam is kicked out of the public space and pushed into a corner. A cuddly religion is only one who has its back to the wall. And, is, you know, I, and I think there are many people in the Middle East, in North Africa and Asia, who are fighting on the front lines. There's this wonderful play in Pakistan where um, you know, the theater has been bombed a number of times by Islamists. And in this play, uh, there are um, people who are singing and the Islamists come and say, you are not allowed to sing. There is a fatwa against singing. And the singers stand up and say, your fatwa does not apply here. And this is something that people are saying across the Middle East in some of the tiniest villages uh, and uh, some of the darkest corners, some of the darkest corners of the world. You hear of, you know, a girl being stoned to death in Somalia and there's a shooting because people are trying to save her life. An eight-year-old boy gets killed. There is so much resistance. Don't fail to see that resistance. Don't see your face in that resistance. And don't see, and make sure that you do see the fact that you can have a crucial role in changing things, not by bombing people to oblivion, not by bringing economic sanctions that will starve the population while the rulers get richer and richer, but by real international human solidarity. I miss that international human solidarity. I miss it. Where is it? And we need it more. The left has turned its back. And in a sense, this responsibility is now on the free thinkers, the atheists and secularists in the West to show their solidarity and to, 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 to take that extra step to make sure that we can defend human principles which are not Western, they are universal. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I actually thought atheism was a Jewish conspiracy. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I totally support Maryam in, in this. I mean, I, and that's the reason why I started the Global Secular Humanist Movement, which I very much focused on technology and using modern technology to unite uh, seculars all over the world, humanists all over the world to create a positive change. I do think that solidarity is something needed all over. Uh, I mean, I, I was one of these people who needed this solidarity when I was in Iraq. I, I used to send emails asking for help, asking for support, and it was never there. Uh, so, and I always get emails now when I'm in America from people who were in my situation, and, and I can imagine how, how difficult it is to be an atheist uh, 
I mean, I'm not very much a fan of the term ex-Muslim. We can debate that later. But uh, I actually like the term humanist because it says more about who I am rather than what I'm not. I don't consider myself non-white. Uh, I consider myself brown. So uh, back to the topic. I, I do think that there is solidarity that is needed. And I think that if we're all going to be united, at least find a common goal between each other. I know that there is, since I've been involved in the atheist movement on an American level, on a global level as well, there is a lot of inner conflict between these organizations. And that's healthy. I think that everybody has their own approach, and that's very good. But it's also important is for all of us who work in organizations is to find a common ground to work on. And the most important thing is support separation of mosque and state and church and state number one, and to support those who are in need in, in, in countries in which atheism is considered a crime. And thank you for inviting me here. Thank God you. bless you. <laughs> thank you one and all, Christina Roth, Maria Mabazi, and Fajal Saeed al